Thank you. We'll now come to the backbench debate on antisocial behaviour. Diana Johnson to move. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I'd like to start by thanking the Backbench Business Committee for this opportunity to debate an issue which affects every constituency all over the United Kingdom. And certainly in the last couple of years, antisocial behaviour has become one of the biggest issues in my constituency. And I think it's absolutely vital that Parliament continues to debate these bread and butter issues at a time when we seem to be solely uh, squeezed on time to discuss Brexit. Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary and Fire Service in 2018 found that 40% of respondents nationally think that crime and antisocial behaviour is a problem in their own area, and that's up from 25% in 2015. And of course, antisocial behaviour appears in many forms. Gangs of youths hanging around parades of local shops, convenience stores and off-licences, public drinking, vehicle damage and theft, aggressive begging, drug dealing, noise nuisance, attacks on public transport. And in my own constituency recently, we've had the experience of stones being thrown at buses in the Orchard Park area, meaning that the bus companies have had to divert the buses away from that particular area. And of course we know that antisocial behaviour is also about vandalism, graffiti, fly-tipping and rubbish. Now as a constituency MP, I want to make some observations about what's happening locally in my own patch in Hull North, but I also want to draw out some of the common themes that are developing around the United Kingdom, challenge the Minister about what the Government needs to do, and make some suggestions about sharing good practice. So just returning to my home city, Hull is a fantastic city with many good, hard-working people, salt of the earth and proud of their community. Many believe in the best community values of solidarity that we see in friendly societies and trade unions. And I have to say very sadly, this is typified currently by the community coming together in the search for the missing university student, Libby Squire, by the work the emergency service are, do are doing with the University of Hull and students and local people. And it's also shown in the work with young people by Steve Arnott and his Beats Bus crew, or the work of the boxer Tommy Coyle. But like any city or town, Hull has its problems. And sadly, we now have a generation of young people who've grown up in the austerity years. You could call them the austerity generation some of them becoming very difficult to reach. Now, on a visit to a local primary school in my constituency, the Year Sixes told me that they didn't feel safe in their local area. They mentioned youths hanging around in the park who were aggressive and intimidating. They told me of drug dealing going on, and they didn't like the rubbish and fly-tipping blighting where they live. Nationally, 2.2 million children aged 10 to 17 are worried about crime and antisocial behaviour, and 950,000 children have experienced crime and antisocial behaviour. So when I ask constituents to tell me about their experiences of antisocial behaviour, this is what some of them said. Youths on motorbikes screaming around Brand North Bransholm at all hours, making lots of noise and driving dangerously in and out of cars and other motorists, causing them to brake hard. Or groups of intimidating youths also hanging around shops, being verbally abusive and displaying antisocial behaviour around people trying just to use the shops. Always the same ones. I've stopped going now. It's got beyond a joke. Or one of our neighbours banging on our door for quite a few times with his guests. They were shouting as they were all drunk. I called 999 because I didn't have a credit to call on 101. The operator said this isn't an emergency and disconnected my call by advising me to call on 101. And a few minutes later they urinated inside my house through the door. Or this comment. I have been spat at. Threats to slit my fucking throat, threats to smash my fucking face in. Now, feeling safe where you live, work or play is really important to us all. And antisocial behaviour can make people's lives absolutely miserable. And as our local police and crime commissioner, Keith Hunter, says, and he's also the national lead for the police and crime commissioners on antisocial behaviour, 
that antisocial behaviour is often the start of what can lead to serious criminal behaviour if it's not checked and dealt with. And it's clear now that we, as well, we need to reclaim our public spaces for the law-abiding majority. And Keith Hunter has also said that when public services and policing retreat from public spaces, there will always be a section of society who will seek to use that void for their own criminal or antisocial purposes. That hard call encourages others who, under different circumstances, would not be a problem. And then law-abiding people don't go to those areas, reinforcing the takeover by the bad element. And so I have to reflect on the fact that since 2010, there has been a cut to Humberside police budgets of 31%. And until recently, policing levels in Humberside were down to levels not seen since the 1970s. We've stopped seeing police and special constables or PCSOs on our streets, especially outside the city centre. We've also lost our excellent whole community wardens that provided an extra reassuring presence on the streets all around Hull. And it's not just police numbers, equipment has been cut too. So, for example, we no longer have our own helicopter based at Humberside Airport, which could respond quickly, tracking suspects and identifying cannabis factories with its heat-seeking capability. We now share a helicopter with other Yorkshire forces, and, and Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary reported in 2017 of the substandard response to ongoing police incidents by the decline <coughs> in national helicopters. And I'm aware that, uh, of reports that Lincolnshire Police are using police drones, and I wondered if the Minister could reflect upon that as a cost-effective idea that other police forces should consider uh, using more widely. Now, the police, uh, the police settlement uh, this week does not, sadly, produce the central government funding that uh, police forces need. Humberside's Police and Crime Commissioner says services are stretched to breaking point and he's now having to consult on a 6.4% council tax precept increase. And let's remember this is a regressive tax. It's on the just managing to raise the money that he needs to stabilise the police numbers and meet increasing costs of the force. But thankfully, we do have a police and crime commissioner who's actively recruiting and training police officers to restore some of the numbers lost since 2010. And he recognises the reassurance of having a presence focused on the front line. Very happy to. Thank my honourable friend for giving away, and she's making absolutely vital points on the issue of antisocial behaviour. And she mentioned earlier on the role of community support officers and the cuts to community support officers, which is why the Welsh Government stepped in in Wales to fund community support officers across Wales when the UK Government cut the funding. Isn't this a stark reminder of the difference between Labour and Tory Government's record on police and women yeah, government? Yeah. I'm very really grateful to my honourable friend for making that intervention. I think that sets out very clearly the difference and how uh, the role of PCSOs are valued in Wales. I do want to say, though, that there are some good initiatives happening um, in Humberside to tackle antisocial behaviour. And I think particularly when the police work alongside some of our very active Labour councillors, people like Rosie Nicola, Gary Waring, Steve Wilson, Gwen Lunn, Marjorie Brabazon and Anita Harrison, who are all determined to tackle antisocial behaviour in their own areas. So, for example, the use of a mobile cop shop to move to areas when problems develop. And with the current problems with attacks on buses, the plan to use a Trojan bus, which will have police on board who can take action if um, stones and uh, other items are thrown at the bus. They can stop the bus and get off and deal with it. And also, the police are using in local schools a video to show the effects of antisocial behaviour. A video which I think came from Dundee of an example where a child threw a stone at a driver who then swerved and hit a pram and killed a baby. And I think that that kind of um, video is useful in educating children and young people about the effects of what they think might be a prank. 
Now, Humberside have also pioneered Operation Yellowfin to combat crime with motorbikes, which is again a, a, a big problem in my area. And this has received national recognition, working, for example, with local petrol stations to stop people who are committing antisocial behaviour on motorbikes and mopeds being able to buy petrol. But we need a routine, long-term police presence to deter and detect antisocial behaviour, not just these special one-off operations when things get really bad. Well, my yes, happy to. I'm, I'm grateful to my honourable friend for giving way. Does she agree with me that the fundamental problem with this, uh, this issue is that with 21,000 police officers taken out of the system, along with antisocial behaviour, um, uh, 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 sorry, uh, along with PCSOs and others, it is an uphill struggle. And what we need is the government to take very seriously that they need to put in very significant resources if we are able, if we are to tackle antisocial behaviour, because the police at the moment are facing the challenge of dealing with violent crime, which went up by 19% in the last year. So they're deprioritising, by necessity, antisocial behaviour, which is making people's lives a complete misery and terrorising our constituents. My honourable friend is absolutely right, and I couldn't agree more with what, what she's just said. I also think we need to recognise uh, the work that my honourable friend, the member for Hull Western Hessel, has been doing, identifying the off-rolling of pupils in our schools. Now, the reason why that's important is because with the changes to the education landscape and the academisation of schools, we are seeing <coughs> numbers of children increase, children not in school but are being home educated. They disappear from the school system, but they often then become part of the antisocial behaviour problem and I'd be interested to know what the Minister's view on that is and whether she's willing to speak to her colleagues in the Education Department and also whether she believes that a proposal for education to be represented on the Community Safety Partnerships might be a way forward of, of dealing with this particular issue and I also just want to raise the issue of mental health because I think mental health is an issue where there is very much more that we need to do to recognise that antisocial behaviour, what it does to people's health and well-being, as well as also recognising that mental health issues can often or sometimes be uh, a reason why perpetrators uh, get involved in antisocial behaviour and the help that they need and require. Now, um, one idea which could be rolled out nationally, of course, came out of New York in the 1990s when the mayor there took that zero tolerance approach to antisocial behaviour, fly tipping, rubbish, and graffiti. So, and that had really positive outcomes. So, if a window was broken, it was fixed, and if rubbish was piled up, it was uh, moved, and people were dealt with if they behaved in an antisocial way. But for that to work, it needs stable funding. And as my honourable friend was just saying from Bethnal Green and Bow, that's a real, uh, that has to come from uh, central government. And it also needs a multi-agency approach. And I also believe strong political leadership nationally and locally. Now, I understand that there is a plan to do, to do this very thing in my own constituency in Beverley Road, which has multiples, multiple issues connected to antisocial behaviour, but sadly it's been much talked about, but not too much progress so far, and communities are still suffering from the blight of antisocial behaviour. One other issue I'd like the Minister to look at is the effect of supported housing for those with drug and alcohol problems, mental health issues, or perhaps just recently having left prison. In Hull, there are many projects housed in Victorian terraced housing in tightly packed neighbourhoods with limited support. I often have complaints of shouting, swearing, drinking, drug taking, threats of violence from these properties. I also have a large hostel, Westbourne House, in a residential area, which along and along with the Police and Crime Commissioner, we believe it's in the wrong location and causes antisocial behaviour problems to that neighbourhood. Now, establishing such hostels and uh, supported housing in settled communities can cause these real problems, and I hope the Minister will be able to say something about better guidance for where they should be located, better monitoring and enforcement of contracts, and also questions, uh, and I also question whether more powers are needed by the CQC. 
And alongside all of this, I have to mention that the National Audit Office shows the scale of funding reductions to my city since 2010 has decreased by 37% in government funding to the Council. So early intervention schemes have been scaled back and only focused on those most desperately in need when in crisis. And children's centres changed from their original purpose of a universal service to all families and voluntary and youth groups cut. And along with all these other cuts, we are now creating, or we're now at the point where we've got a perfect storm in, in our most disadvantaged communities. And often it's such a false economy when cuts to services mean that we will, it will cost taxpayers much more in the longer term. Now, one area of, of unsocial behaviour I just want to talk about briefly is about neighbours, neighbour disputes. And often constituents have raised with me that they have to fill in numerous diary sheets and nothing ever happens. And the whole City Council tell me they have to demonstrate a pattern of behaviour, so they need the sheets to prove that. And even though, even then, the behaviour may not be serious enough for enforcement action, i.e. eviction. And I'm also told that current pressure on the courts mean that when Hull City Council does go for eviction and has all the evidence to hand, it can take up to eight months or more for that to happen. And even when they get hearing dates, they're frequently adjourned. But this type of neighbour antisocial behaviour causes real upset and distress. And I wanted to know from the Minister what more she thinks she could do to tackle this. I, one of my final points is about legislation. And of course, when the coalition government came in in, in 2010, they changed antisocial behaviour legislation, I think led by the Liberal Democrats who thought that Labour's antisocial behaviour legislation was too draconian and obviously felt they needed to be more on the side of the perpetrators than the victims. So we've, yeah. we've seen the introduction of things like the Community Protection Notice. Now that can work quite well. Um, but it can't be issued to under 16s. So you, your only option then is to use injunctions. And what I'm told by the council is the problem with an injunction is it's very hard to enforce. Hull City Council have to get good evidence and signed affidavits and apply to court and pay fees. So they've got the burden of getting the injunction, but then if it's breached, there's very little that happens. And that also links with my concern about criminal behaviour orders, which are only available once the conviction has been achieved. And I came across recently a young man given a C CBO, breached it multiple times, went to court, and no action was taken, yet he was terrorising a local community. I've written to the Justice Minister several times and not had a satisfactory response, so I hope the Minister might be able to help me uh, get that. So I would suggest it's time for a review of the legislation and also a review of the training and understanding of the effects of antisocial behaviour uh, the, by the judi judiciary. Now, in conclusion, I just wanted to remind uh, the House, and the House may have heard this story already, but it's a story that my uh, friend, the former Right Honourable Member for Hoban and St Pancras used to tell, so it's Frank Dobson, he used to tell it about uh, Lena Jager, who was campaigning as a Labour candidate in the 1953 by-election, and she canvassed a woman in a block of flats in Camden Town. Lena launched at that time into the great left-wing issue of the day, which was about Ger German rearmament and the threat that it posed to international peace and security. And when Lena paused for breath, the constituent asked, Did you come up in the lift? Yes, dear, replied Lena. Stinks of piss, doesn't it? said the woman. Yes, dear, said Lena. Can't you stop them pissing in the lift? asked the woman. I don't think I can, said Lena. Well, said the woman, if you can't stop them pissing in our lift, how can you expect me to believe that you can stop the Germans rearming? So in 2019, if we can't get all our agencies working together to stop you throwing st stones at buses in Orchard Park or tackle aggressive uh, begging in my patch in Newland Avenue, how will voters believe that we can sort out the big challenge facing us around Brexit? The question is that this House has considered antisocial behaviour. Chris Green. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a pleasure to uh, uh, follow, the, uh, follow the Honourable Member from Kingston upon Hall uh, North, who have touched on so many important issues 
in her speech. Now, I'd like to start off on this uh, general debate about antisocial behaviour by uh, thanking the Secretary of State and the Policing Minister for the additional resources that's been given to Greater Manchester Police uh, recently. That's very welcome, uh, but I wouldn't like to suggest uh, that we wouldn't appreciate more uh, following where that came from. Uh, I think the uh, additional money is welcome, but it's so important for the Police and Crime Commissioner of Greater Manchester, who is also the Mayor, to ensure that the, we have the fair distribution of those resources right across Greater Manchester. I think there's a concern often that there is too much focus within uh, Greater Manchester Police on uh, Salford and Manchester and certain parts of Greater Manchester, rather than where I am more interested in uh, representing parts of the boroughs of Bolton and Wigan. I think there is a very strong feeling locally that we do need that fair distribution of uh, policing resources. And the Honourable Lady was quite right to um, uh, perhaps to some extent put this in the context of Brexit in getting uh, that right. After Brexit, uh, antisocial behaviour and law and order more generally is the single most uh, important and commonly raised issue. And Brexit hopefully will be done and dusted in uh, a matter of weeks. But I think the questions and concerns uh, raised in terms of antisocial behaviour and law and order uh, are significantly longer term and uh, need more focused, concerted action over that uh, longer term. Now, people do write to me, email me, uh, raise on social media, uh, public meetings that I hold. Uh, antisocial behaviour is a very frequent concern uh, that's raised. Uh, recently, the communities in uh, Ladybridge and in West Horton have held community meetings, very well attended community meetings. I always think if people come out perhaps on a, a beautiful sunny evening when they could be spending time with their family or enjoying uh, life, that they come to a, a community centre, that, that really does show a strength of feeling. And these meetings have been incredibly well attended, and people have been very vocal about their concerns, uh, whether it's antisocial behaviour, uh, in terms of uh, the behaviour of neighbours, and what's going on next door, and the inability of uh, policing and other agencies to deal with uh, disruptive neighbours, but also uh, events and activities that go on, on the high street and more widely. There is a sense that there is an inability or an unwillingness, perhaps, to uh, deal with these concerns. And over time, what may be a very low level, what may be a relatively small concern, does develop and does get worse. And there is that, as the Honourable Lady did point out, uh, the sense if you can nip these problems in the bud, uh, prevent it early on, it prevents these problems from getting worse. Now, in Allerton, there has been a couple of very serious instances of uh, violent crime. Um, at the library uh, recently in Allerton, uh, there was a very serious uh, stabbing incident. There's been other instances on the high street in Allerton of violent crime, and it leads to that greater concern, that greater feeling that people have about things getting out of hand. Now, I did have a meeting with the uh, chief superintendent and superintendent of uh, local uh, police, and it was reassuring. Uh, in that meeting that they were confident they were reorganising, they were going to have that better, that stronger community focus, that community uh, relationship in terms of uh, policing and that kind of uh, community relationship being restored. Now that's very useful for the police to better understand, for the local police to better understand the local community and what's going on there, but also for the local community to better understand and better know the local police. And increasing that visibility, I think, does have a deterrence effect, also does improve people's confidence. And we want people to be confident when going around the community, being part of the community. If people don't feel confident about uh, getting out and about and about being involved and engaged in the community, I think that can lead people to withdraw. And as people withdraw from the community, so problems can easily uh, get worse and then get out of hand. And it becomes then a bigger challenge for the uh, police to deal with. Now, uh, recently, I did spend a little bit of time with the police on a Saturday night uh, on one of their shifts, just to see uh, what it's like, what, uh, what concerns they have. Now, the concerns that a, uh, a bobby on the beat or uh, someone in a patrol car 
there can be an immense number of different concerns that they have to deal with. And it does speak to the quality and the ability of our police force, our police services, about the range of concerns they deal with and how effectively they do deal with these concerns. And one of the biggest worries that they have is over alcohol and our high streets and the impact of people having a little too much to drink can have when they're out and about. And that is a serious concern. Uh, but I also think, on the other hand, there are those uh, concerns about alcohol, but we can also reflect on good pubs, good pub management, uh, good landlords and landladies, and the effect and the influence they can have. Because I think that is where that community aspect, that community quality does come into uh, drinking. I think um, having a drink, uh, our pubs are a really important part of our local community. And good management, good uh, landlords and landladies can actually help create a good, healthy environment in the pubs and therefore help reduce any concerns uh, that may appear on the streets. I'll give way, yes. Um, would he um, agree with me, though, that for some communities uh, are not interested in going to the pub, they actually want to drink in the street, yeah. and the street becomes their drinking place, frightening residents and um, seeing lots of consequent antisocial behaviour that frightens people from their town centres. I agree entirely. Uh, on, on a slightly different note, there's a, a concern in uh, Horwich that residents have been raising with me. There's uh, uh, a, a fishing lake, a small fishing lake, and people are sitting around the lake very late into the evening, whether there's drugs involved or drinking involved. Just that presence there uh, and the rowdiness and the noise that goes with it is really upsetting, really off, uh, putting to people. Perhaps people want to take their uh, families, young children, on the high street. They shouldn't have to avoid the high street past a certain hour uh, in the evening. They shouldn't uh, have to avoid uh, parts of my constituency uh, because there's people uh, with uh, rowdy, inconsiderate behaviour. And that's where the police really do have to react, really ha do have to get involved. Because a police presence, just a little bit of visibility every now and then, can actually tone down people's behaviour. And they therefore will have more respect. And it, it actually improves the environment. And if we can get more families, more people involved in the high street and elsewhere in the community, I think that actually also has a civilising impact rather than, uh, in a sense, the, the high streets and those environments being evacuated uh, from those people. And then it's left to those people drinking in the street. So I do think also that antisocial behaviour does link in as well, uh, the, the way the policing uh, manages the situation. It does actually link in, I think, to sentencing and the courts and magistrates. I do think there needs to be a more res a robust approach there. And constituents really do uh, raise with me frequently about um, uh, concerns in terms of uh, prisons as well, about prison sentencing and the opportunities uh, for rehabilitation. And we ought really, I think, to be looking at the whole uh, criminal justice system and seeing what needs to be done there. And I think there is, whether it's policing, courts, prisons, more resources are required uh, in all of those areas. Thank you. Graham Jones. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I concur with um, uh, the previous speakers. I'd like to congratulate the member for Kingston Hon Hall for bringing this important debate to this chamber because it is a, a, a significant matter to a considerable number of residents um, in our constituencies and I do believe that we need to find uh, some better answers. So I'd like to congratulate the uh, member for Kingston upon Hall North uh, for securing this backbench uh, debate. I didn't want to say a lot but I'll try and say a bit more and I think there's might be a little bit more time. But antisocial behaviour is just so frustrating for our constituents. And whether you don't have a lot of money and you live on a terrace street and somebody kicks your wing mirror off because they want to, and then they kick it off a month later, to uh, youths in the street who think that it's entertaining to act in an aggressive or, or a surly manner, but actually it, um, it just uh, uh, brings about fear uh, in others to noise nuisance, to neighbours who just want to endlessly argue and disrupt other people's lives. 
To people who just want to deny others an amenity, it may not be that in person that they do something, but their actions from graffiti to destruction to vandalism to whatever, to the way that they uh, keep their property or their neighbourhood. And the general loss of, and, and vandalising open spaces and playgrounds forever being vandalised. And I think it just, uh, it, 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 it just destroys community, that loss of amenity and that threat. And yet it's something that I don't think that we uh, uh, take as seriously as our, our constituents do. Um, so this debate is extremely serious to me because it blights so many communities. And in my constituency in Aslan and Ivan, um, it's no different to, to many other constituencies. Um, it's a bugbear having to sit in uh, surgeries and listen to constituents coming in about issues that you can't deal with um, that's very frustrating or to deal with is exceedingly slow uh, and yet you know that individual um, is suffering. Uh, I always say to my staff, uh, funnily enough, that antisocial behaviour is the number one issue that I want us to tackle when people come into my uh, office or surgery. I want you to give it the highest priority because it is so destructive, it can be destructive hour by hour day by day. In fact, my uh, cousin Vicky at the minute, she's got some of you thinks that um, playing her terrace house, thinks that playing loud music at four o'clock in the morning and shouting uh, is appropriate. I'm in a very dysfunctional family. And uh, she works. And you can imagine the implications. It's driving around the bend. Very little can be done. It's very slow um, and uh, very difficult to get to a resolution. Uh, uh, on that issue, and that is typical uh, uh, of many of the antisocial behaviour issues that uh, my constituents face. And so it blights lives in many ways. You know, a lot of the time, uh, such incidents uh, uh, would not be considered serious enough. And they, do, they do have this huge and scarring and detrimental impact uh, on the lives of, uh, of the victims. And I, and I think that. Um, uh, well, I would appeal to members of Parliament that um, we must escalate this as an issue. Uh, for the damage often doesn't affect MPs. Um, how many MPs live in a deprived area? How many MPs have to suffer uh, the consequences of antisocial behaviour? Uh, and I think in some ways because we don't... Gentlemen, give way. Have... Um, 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 can I say to my honourable friend that this feels uh, like deja vu to me because yeah. when I became an MP in 1997, one of the biggest issues was antisocial behaviour. But at that time, under the guidance of the Prime Minister, Tony Blair, we had huge action to try and tackle antisocial behaviour, whether it was safer neighbourhood teams, uh, police teams being based in town centres, the introduction of the ASBO, the discussion about what you did about antisocial, uh, antisocial tenants. These are all issues that we are now going backwards on and we are reinventing the wheel that was there but yeah. we have resiled from. Here, here, here. I, I concur. I think my honourable friend has seen a advanced copy of my, of my speech as I go along <laughs> as I want to raise a number of these issues, so I will, I will not address them directly now, but I will, I will come to them. Except to say, one thing that I, I'm not going to say, but she's quite right, is on council estates, when we moved away from the old tenant manager and collecting rents uh, at the door, and I don't suggest that we do collect rents at the yeah. door, but when we did have that system, it had some advantages, and now we've replaced it by a system in which there seems to be not as much supervision, uh, and I think... Uh, it brings with it difficulties and an increase in antisocial behaviour. So I wasn't highlighting the MPs who were sat here today, of course, because the ones who were sat here are clearly exceedingly concerned uh, uh, with antisocial behaviour in their constituency. Um, but it's worth mentioning at the heart of all of this is that this week we voted on the police funding settlement. <laughs> and I don't think there's any escape from the fact that if you reduce police numbers, and there are other aspects of the police and criminal justice system that um, uh, I'll, I'll go on to comment on. But if you reduce police numbers, you reduce police presence, then of course that's going to have a detrimental impact because, like my honourable friend, the member for Kingston upon Hull North, said, 
that there will be an opportunity where there is a vacuum in policing for those with a malign or malevolent uh, attitude to others uh, to uh, behave in a way that is uh, not conducive to the well-being of the victim or, or the neighbourhood or the community. So I think that we've got to put that right. I think it's wrong that the government has cut policing so significantly. Um, I think that uh, the consequences are considerable. And when I asked my local police and crime commissioner in Lancashire, Clive Grunshaw, who is doing a very good job, uh, uh, about the situation, he said, well, he's lost a considerable number of officers. He's lost 800 officers in Lancashire uh, and 450 members of police staff, which is never mentioned, by the way, because that just diverts resources. Uh, and what we've also seen is not just the loss of police officers, but we ha introduced in 2002, and I'll, I'll come to this in a minute, or I'll, I'll, I'll go over it now, but the, we introduced around 2002, the Labour government under Tony Blair, uh, neighbourhood policing. Mm -hmm. After seeing rising crime year on year, decade on decade, we began to reverse <coughs> that cycle. And no more so than in antisocial behaviour and low level crime with the introduction of neighbourhood policing. A positive, progressive approach to some of these issues. And I know that we must have sanctions, and I'll come to the sanctions in a minute. But at the heart of reducing antisocial behaviour was neighbourhood policing. I talk about my ward in Peel Ward I represented as a councillor before I came here. Um, you know, we had instances in 2002 running at uh, 120 uh, antisocial behaviour incidents a month. Spring Hill, a neighbouring ward, had just over that nearly 130. Imagine that, and the small wards in my constituency. Constant harassment of residents, day after day after day. When neighbourhood policing came in in Lancashire, and it came into my ward uh, uh, at the very beginning uh, of the rollout. We began to see huge reductions in antisocial behaviour. And within about three years, I think we were down to 10 or 15 incidents per month of antisocial, of recorded antisocial behaviour. So down to about 10 or 11% of what it was, was previously. And the residents breathed a sigh of relief. But they were angry. I remember holding a public meeting in, um, uh, in Accrington, uh, the council offices. The room can hold about 140. Uh, this is just prior to neighbourhood policing. And we had nearly 200 turn up. Couldn't get them in. It was quite dangerous. People were packed at the back and pushing to get in. And the anger was incredible. And I don't want to return to those days. I don't want to return to the days where I get a telephone call and I'm so sick of antisocial behaviour that at after midnight I just rock up out of the house, go round to a neighbour's house where there's a gang of 20 jobs and confront them myself on, <coughs> on Bold Street and I think there's a videotape somewhere of me com uh, confronting them. And I think residents just thought that's, that is the end of it. When you've got your councillor going out to confront these after midnight um, another group of 25 at the bottom of my street who I confronted and one of them threatened to glass me there and then. You know, this is where we were in 2002 and I think that when neighbourhood policing was introduced, I think what we saw was a progressive answer that saw a huge reduction in antisocial behaviour. But it wasn't just uh, a police presence on the ground. So I've asked my Police and Crime Commissioner, and I say this now openly, my constituents may be watching this, to increase the police preset by as much as he possibly can. That's my view. I'm going to tell the truth. We've got to put police officers back on the beat. We've got to get policing back to a neighbourhood level. Now, if the government wants to continue with its cuts, all we're doing by increasing the preset is replacing officers we've lost by... Off I to... If he's asking his PCC to make the sort of changes he's uh, suggesting, and which of course he's absolutely right to do so as a local MP, could he also ask his Police and Crime Commissioner why he's not? He's keeping £37.9 million in reserves in a savings account, and why they've increased by £17.8 million since 2011. He's getting the money, but it seems on this he's not spending it. Explain to the government minister how finance works. You most got most authorities, public authorities, usually keep about five to ten percent back, and that's the advice by the audit commission. 
because what they pay out each month might have, have peaks and troughs. So it, it, will, it will rise, and so they need to have uh, some money uh, there to, to do that. There's also a capital investment programme. Uh, she may not know, but I know that Blackpool Police Station is crumbling and needs replacing. And the Police and Crime Commissioner needs to know that he's got the money, and if he's prudent, and he's a Labour Police and Crime Commissioner, so he is prudent, uh, and he is saving year on year to replace Blackpool Police Station. Well, I, I say to the minister who's chuntering there it, that Blackpool North is, is a conservative uh, is a conservative constituency, and if she doesn't want Blackpool Police Station being done, then just get to the dispatch box and say so. She, I give way to the minister. She doesn't want Blackpool Police Station doing. Just say so. I visited Blackpool North on Friday. I sat in a meeting with some of the people who make the most difference in the local area, including my honourable friend, the uh, member for Blackpool North, and. The the police officers, the community groups, councillors. We weren't talking about buildings. We were talking about the great work that officers, community groups and the council do to keep that area safe. I, I concentrate on, pe on people rather than bricks and mortar. I think, I think so far I've talked about it. But it's, uh, <laughs> what, I would, what I would say to the Minister is there was no answer to my question. It's, it seems that she doesn't really care about Blackpool Police Station. I'm happy. If your Minister wants to get up and speak about Blackpool Police Station, I'm more than happy. To my... Uh, I would like to say, a friend, that the member for Fylde. Uh, That's great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, just, just for the record, the Bonny Street Police Station in Blackpool is indeed crumbling, and it's, it's an absolute disgrace. But a new shiny replacement has already opened uh, right on the edge of my constituency. It opened uh, probably about six months ago. Uh, and so it's... Uh, I hear what the, the gentleman is saying in a stout defence of the, the Labour uh, Police and Crime Commissioner, but to use it the example of Blackpool and Bonnie Street and its new replacement, which is now opened, is maybe not the best one. In answer, in answer to, 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 to the member for Fylde, I was using it as an example of why you would retain, re retain reserves, as an example, and he has just proved the point that I've been making, that the Police and Crime Commissioner, Clive Grunshaw in Lancashire, does a wonderful job by making sure that the reserves. So, as he says, Blackpool and the Conservative MP gets a brand new shiny police station, not the crumbly one. That is why I call fiscal responsibility. Yeah, 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 so, yeah, when yeah. the minister gets to her, her feet and makes these, well, she didn't actually make any point to, to the point that I made about the police station. She, she was saved. She was saved by one of her backbench members, to be fair, <laughs> uh, on, on that issue. But this is about prudence. And when we talk about people, I think what the Minister ought to... to well, she, perhaps you should listen uh, 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 to the points that I've made earlier, that this is about staff and people and communities and neighbourhoods. So we've lost 800 staff. So I'll return to the point that I was making. It's not just the savings. And by the way, there's a difference between capital and revenue, and I'll point that out to the Minister. Uh, another obvious point. <laughs> however, however, what I, would, what I would say to it is, 800 staff means that you are going to have an increase in antisocial behaviour. 450 staff that have been removed from the back office, which has an impact, and neighbourhood policing now, and the neighbourhood policing units that have basically collapsed. They are no longer in existence. We've gone back to 1990s response policing where people drive round or did drive round and increasingly do, and I've been out with the police at night on several shifts just become a blue light operation in panda cars. That is what Lancashire Constabulary has been reduced to and when you've got serious like knife crime or, or some big incident you can't deal with antisocial behaviour, you can't have a progressive solution if you've stripped out the policing, if you've stripped out uh, neighbourhood policing. So I said, I just I want to touch on one other point that I want to make, is uh, in the last government and the Liberals, I sometimes get sick and fed up of, 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 of Liberal politicians saying that we shouldn't have CCTV cameras, mm. all this nonsense of the, about catching criminals. Mm. I would say to ministers, please listen to constituents and residents and be on their side. Don't be on the Liberals' side. These people suffer and would like to see CCTV and they don't see it as a problem. And I will gently say that to, to the Minister. So I've asked for the police for the precept to be raised, and I, and, and I say that quite openly. But the public have been asked, and 78% of those surveyed support the move. Now, I'd like to say that I'm in touch, but obviously in this particular instance I am. The public want to see more police on the beat. They want to see our police policing antisocial behaviour. 
So, Madam Deputy Speaker, these cuts have really affected our areas. They have really affected Pineburn and Haslingdon. We have no presence on the streets apart from a blue light presence. And I know sometimes a Chief Constable doesn't want to send that message out and he may, he, he may have uh, something to say in my ear. But I, I say back to him and I say it to him then, I'm sorry Andy, but unfortunately that's the, that's the nature. There are no uh, PCSOs or, or uh, 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 beat uh, constables out anymore. Our neighbourhood policing teams have been seconded to other duties. The neighbourhood policing teams have collapsed in Lancashire and it is simply it is simply not fair. And so what have we got? In the last few weeks we've had a vigilante group begin and this is where you end up because antisocial behaviour is, uh, is uh, exceedingly aggravating uh, to so many and uh, an Accrington vigilante group has begun, I think they're called Hindman Watch, they've got their own uniform and various other uh, uh, accompanied uh, uh, semi-official regalia and uh, they're out patrolling the streets at night. Is this what it's come to, that we can't deal with antisocial behaviour and we can't protect the public and they to protect themselves and they're going to pay uh, for the privilege in taxes of, of a non-existent services? These people are putting themselves in uh, danger mm. and I'm deeply concerned about it. It is not the right approach. These nine years of police cuts have affected Lancashire. And I know there are colleagues on the other side of the chamber who privately and occasionally publicly agree with that and don't agree with their own government on, uh, on the scale of the cuts that have hit our communities. So antisocial behaviour is something that continues to worry me and more and more people around this uh, country. The Office of National Statistics published information that showed between October 2018 and September 2018 there was a staggering 13% increase in people experiencing or witnessing antisocial behaviour. The links between further austerity and cuts are clear when you look at the figures and they're broken down into categories. There was a rise of 28% of people experiencing or witnessing groups hanging around on the streets. But local authorities, I mean, I want to see a progressive solution to this, but what have we got with local authorities? The youth clubs are closing in my area, they've closed, I think we've consolidated from five to one. And there, is, there isn't a progressive offer for these people. They're roaming around the streets, they say they've got nowhere to go, but in truth now they have nowhere to go. Um, and it is very difficult for them. And we should be starting with looking at progressive answers for the vast majority who really do want to abide by the law but perhaps on a bad day or on a few days, them and the mates get carried away and they disrupt other people's lives, but they're not intrinsically bad people. I'll come to those that are the worst of offenders and how we should deal with them in a minute. But we must have a progressive solution. And it's worrying that these crime statistics are up, because I have to say this, and the coroner says this, we've seen a massive increase in county lines of drugs in Hindburn and Haslingdon. Cocaine is a wash on the streets and young people are getting involved through the county lines. You can get cocaine anywhere at its purest level and, and never on the scale that you can now. But when I ask for the police sniffer dogs to go in, then there is again a lack of policing. It, we're unable to do it, to try and resolve some of these issues. But young people involved in antisocial behaviour are slipping into a life of crime. So we need to be uh, very concerned about antisocial behaviour uh, at its worst uh, for how it will materialise uh, further on. So I just want to say that in all of this, we need to try and go back to some basic principles. When we were tough on crime and tough on the causes of crime, we had the right policies. And we need to get back to being tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime. And we've, ne we've never uh, controlled antisocial behaviour more than when we had that policy. And uh, the architects of that policy, as uh, my honourable friend for Kingsborough on Old North said, uh, should be congratulated because it was uh, a breakthrough. Instead, we've seen a rollback in the last few years. And that does include, and I know it was mentioned, that we need to, a reformed ASPOR needs to come back without a shadow of a doubt. I don't want to see people go to prison, that's where the reform needs to be. But local authorities and police should be able to implement or impose ASPORs where and is necessary. 
on some of these individuals, the worst elements. We need to go back to what matters and listen to people. We need to have a community-centred approach <coughs> to tackling this issue. But I think we need to look, as the Honourable Member for Bolton West said, look at the criminal justice system. <coughs> At the minute, the worst offenders, I'm not talking about the majority, those that go on to repeat uh, 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 antisocial <coughs> behaviour, we need to look at the criminal justice system. Yeah. Community payback doesn't particularly work in some instances, repeat offences, and prison doesn't work. And we need to find something in the middle. That doesn't send them back into peer ward, where the anger angry mates and commit more antisocial behaviour. And I think we need to look at other aspects of the criminal justice system so that we have a criminal justice system that's progressive, that trains people, that gets them out of this. And for those that want to carry on, is does sanction them and is punitive, but with some progressive element or on educational that, element. On that point, I'm very grateful to my old friend for giving way. And I wonder whether he'd agree with me that the changes and amendments that need to happen in the justice system are part of a very complex solution to this, and no one golden bullet is going to solve all problems. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, in, in conclusion, I, I agree with that, and I've said that we should always start with a progressive answer, but for those that, that, that are regressive and refuse to behave, then we need to look at a reformed and tougher criminal justice system. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Yeah. Martin Whitfield. I'm grateful, Madam Deputy Speaker. And it is a great pleasure to follow my honourable friend um, and his contribution, but also, of course, to thank my honourable friend from Kingston upon Hull North and the Backbench Committee for securing this very, very important debate. I mean, antisocial behaviour, I think most people in this House will agree, forms a huge part of their caseload. And the reality is it's not part of their caseload that perhaps they came into uh, politics to deal with it, but it is the reality of what our individual constituents face frequently on a day-to-day -day basis. And indeed, the constituents that come to see us are the mere tip of the iceberg of the constituents who suffer from antisocial behaviour. I'd like to pay credit to the CAB in Scotland, who have um, an excellent website to help people guide them through the world of antisocial behaviour, because it is incredibly complex. But it starts by giving a list of definitions of what amounts to antisocial behaviour, and ranges from what we've heard today of noise, the shouting, the swearing, the gathering together of groups, harassment, including, of course, racial and sectarian harassment, verbal abuse, the bullying of children, both at school, but where they go beyond school in public recreation grounds. And indeed, we've had the benefit today of two excellent reports from various committees that deal with social media, on which bullying is taking place, and indeed upon the need for early intervention, early in young children's lives, to give them the best possible support into the future. And I want to look at two aspects of antisocial behaviour, because there is antisocial behaviour which is perpetrated by an individual, frequently described as the neighbour disputes, but then there is also the antisocial behaviour that's occasioned by groups. And if we look at the antisocial behaviour that's occasioned by individuals or the neighbours dispute, these are incredibly difficult to get into, to access, to help. But frequently we find, as my honourable friend has said, that in individual cases there are mental health problems that sit behind that. And indeed, as a result of the antisocial behaviour, frequently mm -hmm. mental health problems are passed on to the recipient. And how that's dealt with can be both challenging, difficult and, unfortunately, expensive. But one of the points that I would like to raise, and I would like to, um, the Minister, if possible, to uh, extend a view on this, is in the occasion where people, um, rather than being in rental or leasehold accommodation, are in freehold accommodation, where frequently the recipient of antisocial behaviour gets to the stage where they say, I'm just going to move. It's the simple answer. I'll admit defeat and I want to move away. There is an onus under the current law, both north and south of the border, to disclose those neighbours' dispute in the sale documents, which of course frequently makes selling a house incredibly difficult. And I wonder whether the government have had any thoughts on how to facilitate a method of evening that out, because sometimes the only answer for the person who's suffering that antisocial behaviour is to move away. Would the honourable gentleman agree with me that the exponential growth in private renting 
has an- exacerbated uh, the problems of antisocial behaviour because often law- landlords do not care about the behaviour of their tenant because they don't live next door to them. All they care about is that the rent is getting paid, and that's the end, they, as they see it, of their responsibility. I can't, I can't better, I can't better the, the, the intervention. Indeed, the only reason that I chose to raise the question of freehold um, premises was because that is rarely raised. Um, and indeed, within my constituency, we have had challenges from people um, who have admitted the problems and subsequently found great difficulty in selling the houses. That in no way is to downplay the antisocial behaviour and the pain, suffering, mental health anguish um, and challenges that families in rented accommodation, in supported accommodation and leasehold accommodation indeed um, find. The other area is, of course, and we've heard this discussed today, is where groups exercise a choice of behaviour that's antisocial. And I think here there is something that needs uh, to be pointed out and addressed because I think it perhaps is a key to trying to solve the problem. The first is that I've found where we've had groups and um, in East Lothian, my constituency in Preston Pans, where I live, which is of course um, in Scotland, so processes within this are devolved. There have been great challenges amongst our early teenagers who hang around in groups and go around. I know a significant number of those individuals, having had the privilege to teach them at primary school, and they are not bad people. But sometimes, when they group together, there is a group mentality that takes over, and actions and behaviours become acceptable to the group that, as individuals, in all honesty, they would never, never contemplate doing. And I think there is much work that needs to be done Um, into this group mentality to try and aid and abet some of the very best work that's going on to defeat um, antisocial behaviour. And I raise an example of that from my own community where a new play park was put in predominantly for children under sort of 10 years old but particularly for children who were preschool. And one of the great discussions was how are we going to stop this equipment being damaged? And the way it was done was by bringing the older brother and sisters in to the park to explain why this equipment was so important to their younger brothers or sisters. And suddenly feeling an identity to the community that were going to use the facilities gave those older children an empowerment to look after it. And I know that a significant number of those children and young people went to other young people to say, don't damage the park. It's for my little brother and sister. And this, I think, gives an indication to where antisocial behaviour is. Antisocial behaviour is occasioned in the main by people who become disassociated from their communities, be it their neighbour, because they're playing the television too loud, be it a group who have nothing to do because of the closure of after-school clubs, be it groups of vigilantes who have lost faith in the community in society, in their politicians and those people that they've elected to govern them to look after and solve a problem. And I think that there are no simple answers to this. I could stand here and rail against the austerity because simply withdrawing assets and funding is a huge problem and has caused this isolation to increase and magnify. But I think that responsible leaders and responsible government need to admit that that withdrawal has gone too far. We need to re-empower our communities and our society, and that will cost money. That empowerment should come through the local authorities with more devolved power and responsibility, so they in turn can devolve it back into communities, so people again feel connected to what is happening around them, so that they don't have to phone their councillor after midnight and say, come and speak to these 20 people. They may indeed be able to speak to the person and say, look, you can't really have a party that invites all of these people, and that the connection between those people will be such that antisocial behaviour reduces. He's raising a point that perhaps I I missed, but I would ask him to perhaps consider one of the failures of this government is the number of NEETs that we have running between 6 and 10% across every county and area. Where are these young people? What are they doing? Why are they not in education and training? 
I'm very grateful for I'm very grateful for the intervention, and it's true. I think what he highlights is um, by any uh, dispute of the statistics, which I feel may be coming. If you become disassociated, if you become disconnected from your education, if you become disconnected from your family and from your friends for whatever reasons, why should you buy into the society that you find yourself in? If your housing, be it rental, is inadequate, if you have water coming down the wall, if you have a landlord who just doesn't care, why should you buy into the society and what your neighbour needs? What I would say is that if we look at young children and their behaviour and their uh, responsibility at school, people innately care about each other. They lose that because of the experiences that they face in life. And I think one of the responsibilities as leaders that we have is to ensure that the funds, to ensure that the assets, to ensure that the skills and strategies are there so that people don't lose that in the first place. If they are at risk of losing it, there is support there to guide them back. That is the after-school clubs. That is the, the mentoring that goes on. That is understanding the responsibility from something as simple as not dropping litter all the way through to being part of a vigilante gang, feeling it is your right to engender justice in a community. And I'm reminded um, of Orlando's great phrase for, in As You Like It, I do desire we must may be better strangers. And I think that's one of the problems that we found in our community. It's becoming much easier to become a better stranger for a whole lot of reasons than it is to become a better friend. There are no simple answers, and I have um, respect for the government who face up to trying to solve the problems. I think there are answers, there are strategies, there are individuals out there who can make our constituents' lives and their families, schools and communities better. And that way we will drive down antisocial behaviour, not by excusing bad behaviour, but showing why that bad behaviour is not acceptable in our society. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Speaker, I start by con congratulating my honourable friend uh, for Kingston upon Hold North for bringing this very important debate uh, to the House. Last November, Ma Madam Deputy Speaker, Bedfordshire Police had to uh, suspend the 101 uh, call service for a few hours because of the budget cuts and the need and very steady rise in the emergency 999 calls. Faced with the difficult uh, the choices, police um, have had to prioritise serious violent crime at the cost of others. Still very important crimes, especially those related to antisocial behaviour. They are simply on the resources to tackle antisocial behaviour properly. The funding formula for the Bedfordshire Police has failed. From an airport that requires a complex and, and expensive uh, counter-terrorism strategy to a town centre prison that places high demand for, on police and emergency services. Bedfordshire is funded as a rural force with the two large and expanding urban centres. It faces all the problems a force like the Met would ex expect to deal with. The community is still reeling from the spate of fatal knife crimes. I have concerns about the knife crime prevention order because it risks criminalising a generation of young people. The police don't need more powers. They need more officers. Bedford is a particular target for county line, line crimes and gang culture is a fast growing problem in our area. The emergency funding grant designed to be used in periods of acute crisis had to be used by Bedfordshire Police to meet day-to-day -day policing. The force is still overstretched and under-resourced. Tough choices have to be made. Channel 4 dispatches a report um, in October says that 57% of the burglaries in Bedfordshire had to be screened out as there were not enough resources for the police to attend them, the highest number in the country. If police are unable to attend burglaries or car-related crimes, they are not going to be able to turn up to a group of teenagers who are street drinking or someone who is urinating in public places. There is no police presence on the streets to deter such a behaviour. Yet, antisocial behaviour is by far one of the most important issues for my constituents. It makes them feel their home isn't safe and their town no longer belongs to them. 
we must tackle the root causes of antisocial behavior. Early intervention and, and uh, some work to prevent uh, these issues are, are, is what is required in Bedfordshire area. Bedford has done well to retain the support service it has against all the odds, with the cuts to Bedford Borough Council and, and social care funding. But we need more of this, not less. We need to fund the local authorities properly to provide the adequate youth and sports services that have proven to work well as a driving force against antisocial behaviour. This cannot be done until the government recognises that the level of antisocial behaviour on our streets are because of their failed policies. And it cannot be done until the government really ends up uh, austerity in front of our police properly. Thank you. Siobhan McDonough. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. For me, and I imagine for yourself, um, some of the debates and the issues we've been raising this afternoon have, were the ones that we were discussing back in 1997 and looking at how to tackle them. And while um, Nirvana never came, certainly progress was made in many of our town centres and our cities. And in a way, we have lost our way and forgotten what was successful, but we do know what worked. Um, in my constituency of Mitchell and Morden, it is not a place that is uh, unique over the last few years. Uh, we've seen a steep rise again in antisocial behaviour on our streets. Um, we've always had our problems, but never before has antisocial behaviour, street drinking and petty crime felt as pervasive or hard to tackle as it does now, particularly around Mitcham Town Centre. I'm afraid the climate of antisocial behaviour has become so intense that the difficulties of suburban shopping centres have become so much worse. A multi-million pound regeneration of the town centre should have meant that Mitcham uh, had begun to get better. Yet when speaking with local businesses, I've been dismayed to hear stories of shop fronts being vandalised, staff being abused and intimidated, and once loyal customers choosing to shop elsewhere, feeling that their local town centre had become unsafe or was simply an unpleasant place to shop. Mums, and principally mums, did not want their children to be in an environment where men urinated in the street or who brawled because they had drunk too much. Antisocial behaviour is a problem that residents often feel powerless to change, but they are no means apathetic. When I caught, welcomed Sophie Linden, London's Deputy Mayor for Crime, and Sally Benatar, our commander of our South West London um, BCU, because we no longer have borough uh, police services in London, to a public meeting in my constituency last June. Hundreds of residents turned up. The place was packed. They were spilling out into the playground outside. They stood for hours to make their point in the sweltering heat. And the concern raised time and time again is we just don't see our police on our streets anymore. We don't see the police community service officers who used to get to know us. We cannot get through to the police. For anybody who has tried to ring 101 knows exactly how difficult it is just to get the, the phone actually picked up. I'm um, afraid that so much in our town centres has begun to get work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very grateful to my old friend for giving way. And just on that point of police officers, frequently it's said by some older residents, I must say, that the previous police officers who were part of the community understood the community and they knew the stories behind what they were frightening. And clearly there's much evidence that says it doesn't matter having police on the beat. But actually, the truth is, police officers who understand their community have a community that understands the police officers as well. And can I completely agree with my honourable friend? Uh, we got that um, kick back in 1997-98, principally from the police, who felt that the best way to deal with crime was in fast cars. But the resulting reduction in crime that came about from the Safer Neighbourhood teams proved substantially that police on the beat 
and police community service officers who were often uh, originally rejected uh, by the police and by the community proved successful because they had the time to build the relationships and get to know people. And when people began, and particularly young people, as, you refer, as the Honourable Member referred to, began to get in trouble, they could bring those agencies together and start to get the support that many of those individual youngsters and their families desperately needed. I'm very grateful to my friend for allowing me to make this point. And I just wanted to get a, a point on the record, because maybe she's somebody in her constituency who she thinks the same about. <coughs> and I'd like to say a big thanks to a PC Dave Pearson uh, as a local beat manager, because he did a fantastic job and he sorted out a lot of antisocial behaviour yeah, yeah. and he deserves me to put it on the record. <laughs> I'm delighted to be able to give way to my honourable friend, thanking our public servants and our police who go that mile to make our areas better is really important. All too often, disgraceful antisocial behaviour just goes unchecked. It goes unchecked because, well, it's not a serious crime. It goes unchecked because the local police team simply do not have the resources to follow up every last incident of vandalism or drunken hooliganism. It goes unchecked because we no longer have the bobbies on the beat to control it. But when a drunken altercation led to the tragic murder of a young man in my constituency last year, it served as a poignant, painful reminder that the gulf between antisocial behaviour and serious crime is not as large as we often allow ourselves to believe. Me Mitchum and Morden has been my, my home all my life, and I am so deeply proud of it. I sincerely want each and every one of my constituents to share the pride in our local area. But it can become desperately hard to ask them to do so when they do not even feel safe in their own community. The simplest truth is there is no substitute for visible police presence in the community. Mitcham needs more bobbies on the beat. I suspect we are often far from alone in that regard. We did not arrive here from nowhere, Madam Deputy Speaker. The rise in antisocial behaviour that we have seen in so many of our communities is the regrettable but inevitable consequence of more than eight years of indiscriminate cuts and biting austerity at the hands of successive governments. In real terms, central government funding for police uh, has decreased by 30 per cent since 2010. We have lost roughly 20 uh, 20,000 police officers in that time, 14% of the workforce. In London, in the London Borough of Merton, a small suburban borough that is the third safest in London, we have lost 90 police officers since 2010. The safer neighbourhood teams that used to belong used to have five officers, a sergeant, two PCs, three police community ser service officers, are now down to two PCs and one PCSO when you can get them. Because when people go on long-term sick or have to move on to somewhere else, those vacancies are not filled. And the important <coughs> Mitcham Safer Neighbourhood team has gone. There is now no longer a team for the town centre. And amazingly, the police officers we used to have based in every secondary school in Merton are also gone because the police cannot recruit quickly enough in order to fill those posts. Retention rates have plummeted because our police don't feel valued, and how could they when year after year they are being asked to take on more work with less support, fewer resources and, in real terms, lower wages? And I have to say, even when they are offered more money, it is difficult to fill those posts. Detectives in the metropolitan uh, uh, police area have been offered £4,000 a year more, but they still not, cannot recruit detectives. The consequence of that for our safer neighbourhood teams is that many of them are forcefully transferred into those roles and are not available to actually um, walk our streets and do the basic work of policing that we know our communities need. The Conservative Party has always taken great pride in its image as a party that would put the police first, come down hard on crime and keep the men and women of Britain safe. 
And yet, with police disappearing from our streets, violent crime on the rise, and many of us feeling more vulnerable than ever before in our communities, I find myself asking the same question as many of my constituents. What ever happened to the party of law and order? Mm. Mary Black. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy, and uh, apologies for getting held up at the beginning of the debate. But I want to start by uh, thanking the Honourable Member for Kingston upon Hill North for bringing such a, a, a debate about such a substantial issue that's affecting. Uh, in Scotland, of course, as we've already heard, it's a, a separate legal system. Um, but we've had the Antisocial Behaviour Act since 2004, and it remains in force and covers police and agency powers in relation to antisocial behaviour. And the Scottish Government has always been clear in their belief that there has to be a partnership approach if we ever hope to effectively tackle antisocial behaviour. And that includes the police, local authorities and the court services. Now, the one thing that I think we can all agree on in this place is that everyone has the right to be and to feel safe in their own home. Uh, I mean, that should be the benchmark for the kind of society that, that we're aiming for. But that also includes having an element of compassion, because those rights also apply to those individuals who sometimes find themselves participating in antisocial behaviour. And that's what I actually want to applaud the, the comments of the member for East Lothian, um, who I thought spoke very eloquently about the need to, to see individuals as people who need help rather than just to simply chastise them as being a problem. And I think this is an important point because if we want to move forward as a society, then we have an obligation to understand why people do the things that they do and why they behave the way they do at certain times. You know, for instance, it's about stopping and saying, is that young person roaming the streets because they're trying to ex escape something horrible in their own home? Are they lashing out as a, a cry for help to somebody? Or, for instance, if, if we find someone intoxicated or aggressive, that someone will assess their mental health at some point. And, and they'll say that if their health is not OK, then we find out why and we figure out how these factors can e edit their decision-making processes and can affect their decision-making. Because only then can we actually begin to develop meaningful preventative measures. And that includes looking holistically at our judicial system, our social security setup, our health structures. Everything plays in and factors into people's lives. So that's what the Scottish Government has tried to do whenever we have the powers to do so. So, for example, since 2008, the Scottish Government has committed £92 million to cash back for communities to fund a, a wide range of projects and facilities throughout Scottish communities. And even in my own constituency, I, I've had the pleasure of seeing the essential support that so many local organisations provide. You know, to name a few, there's Ram H, there's the Kibble, Spark of Genius, the Council's Antisocial Team. We've got street stuff that I played football with, and it's brilliant. They, they just take the time to sit with an individual and treat them as a human being that matters, as opposed to simply being a problem that has to be solved. And they take the time to do that by seeing past all the bravado and any aggressiveness, and they find out what is actually going on in that person's head and life at that moment in time. Because making that effort and taking the time to sit with someone and treating them as a human being that matters, even if they're off the wall, it's about finding out where their mind has taken them and finding ways that we can help bring them back into the real world and support them in such a way. So, on the whole, I'm pleased to say that these measures seem to be having a, a positive impact in Scotland. Experiences and perceptions of antisocial behaviour have reduced over the last 10 years under the SNP. The percentage of adults who felt that people behaving in an antisocial manner was a common issue in their area has fallen from 46% in 08-09 to 29% in 16-17. The Scottish Households Survey 2017 also reflects that trend. So the estimated percentage of adults who actually experienced vandalism has almost halved between 2008-09 and 16-17. Fewer adults now think that violence between groups of individuals or gangs is common in their area has fallen from 26% to 10%. So we seem to be heading in, in the right direction, even if we're not fully there yet. Ultimately, 
I suppose the point of this is that we have to recognise that when we do our best to ensure the welfare of absolutely everyone, it benefits society as a whole. And I think that's exactly what the Honourable Member for uh, East Lothian was, was making that point and saying we have to find a place for everyone. So no matter how challenging or difficult that person is, and I have no doubt that everyone in here has had dysfunctional and difficult constituents come to them, we have to offer some kind of assistance as to how we can legislate better for these kind of issues in the future. And as I say, treating people as though they matter and understanding where they're coming from. So I hope that the, a Scottish perspective has... Uh, has offered some sort of substantial help to the Honourable Member, and I thank her again for bringing this, this debate forward. Yeah. Shadow Minister Carolyn Harris. Th thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I too congratulate the Honourable Member for Kingston upon Hell North for bringing forward today's debate? And can, can I congratulate the Member for Bolton West, Highbourne, East Lothian, Bedford, and Mitchum and Morden for excellent speeches? Antisocial behaviour covers a wide range of unacceptable activity, which causes harm to an individual, to their community or to the environment. Anything from vandalism and littering to street drinking and drug usage, from nuisance neighbours to begging, are all examples of antisocial behaviour. If an action leaves somebody else feeling distressed or harassed or it causes concern for public safety, then it is deemed to be antisocial behaviour. Whilst individually occurrences of antisocial behaviour can appear quite minor, the cumulative impact of persistent incidents within communities can have a highly damaging effect. The most recent crime survey for England and Wales reports that almost 36% of respondents had experienced or witnessed antisocial behaviour in their local community an increase of 5% from the previous year and the highest figure since data was collected in 2012. I'm not surprised by these figures. Drink-related crime was one of the highest types of antisocial behaviour that respondents said they'd experienced. Drinking on streets and public transport can lead to others feeling intimidated and to verbal and physical attacks. And acts of vandalism are all too common in many of our communities. We see endless graffiti on public and private property, and unfortunately, they're not all Banksies. I hear many cases of homes that have been attacked, property that's been damaged, and cars, tyres that have been slashed. We need to seriously crack down on the perpetrators of these crimes. Whilst many, although not all, antisocial behaviours do not physically hurt individuals, the emotional and psychological damage that they cause can be just as harmful. The availability of and use of drugs in our community is a real worry. County Lines has been responsible for a rapid rise in the accessibility of drugs on our streets up and down the country. Gangs are targeting our most vulnerable young people, kids in the care system or those trapped in poverty. Kids who maybe don't have someone waiting for them at home, wondering where they are. These youngsters are being manipulated into the gang culture, which itself is a key factor in much of the antisocial behaviour and the more violent crime, which is becoming far too normalised across society today. And the use of synthetic drugs is still a major cause for concern. Despite the blanket ban on them having heavily diminished the supply, we would be very naive to think that the problem is anywhere near solved. Criminals will continue to produce these highly toxic drugs and people. Often the most vulnerable people will continue to use them and keep up the demand. Individual and groups hanging around on streets with nothing to do or nowhere to go. These who are high on drugs and those who are in need of the next fix or under the influence of alcohol are all potential threats to our local community. Boredom, desperation and rivalry can all be the catalyst of a wide range of antisocial crimes. And while all this is going on, police cuts continue and local authorities are seeing big reductions in their government funding despite unprecedented pressures, all of which means that there are not enough resources to deal with the ever-growing problems. 
Once the headlines read that there will be an additional £970 million fund funding available through the police grant for 2019-2020, it doesn't take long to realise that the reality is very different. £509 million of this will come from Dublin, the police precept for council taxpayers, meaning a further burden on our already hard-pressed constituents. It will also mean that areas with a low council tax base, like South Wales, will be hit the hardest. Alongside this, the £142 million of pension grants from local forces from government central funds falls alarmingly short of the £311 million pension liability. This means that despite core government, central government funding for local forces increasing, in theory by £161 million, in reality, this, together with the pension grant, does not even cover the pension liability. Taking all this into account, the harsh truth is that however the government tried to manipulate the figures, central government funding for local police forces has been cut for the ninth consecutive years. Police numbers are now at their lowest for three decades. Since the Conservatives came into government in 2010, numbers of police officers have reduced by 21,000. 16,000 police staff have been axed and community support officers' numbers have declined by 6,000. All this while the government continues to promise to protect the front line. Public safety should be a priority, but as things stand, some forces are so stretched the tackling anti-social behaviour on their streets is a battle that they are struggling very hard to take control of. But it doesn't need to be like this. The Welsh Labour 2011 manifesto promised more funding for community support officers, and they delivered. While the party opposite have been scaling back and cutting jobs, the Welsh Government, as we heard from the Hon. Hon. Friend from Newport East, has invested 500 more community support officers right across Wales. Labour has a plan to make Britain safer, to recruit more police officers, to take back control of our streets. We need to tackle antisocial behaviour and make sure that our constituents feel safe in their communities. Warm words and manipulated figures do not make our community safe. Resources action and funding is what we need to make our citizens feel safe, our communities feel cared for and our country protected. Thank you. Minister Victoria Atkins. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's been a, a pleasure, albeit uh, 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 difficult, to hear some of the accounts that uh, honourable members across the House have uh, shared with us of the experiences that their constituents uh, have suffered at the hands of those who act antisocially. Uh, may I join in the thanks and congratulations to the Honourable Member for Kingston upon Hull North for securing this debate. Uh, I know of her action locally. I, we share a, a, a television channel, television news uh, programme, and so I know of the work she is doing in her local area. I join her in thanking the officers and all of those who have been involved uh, in uh, looking for Libby Squire, and I'm, we're all conscious, of course, it's a live investigation, um, but our thoughts, I know, are with the family. Uh, I would like to thank uh, honourable members for bringing this uh, debate to the House, speaking, participating in this debate, uh, particularly uh, my honourable friend, the member for Bolton West, as well as uh, honourable members for Hindburn, East Lothian, Bedford, Mitchman Morden, and Paisley and Renfrewshire South. Uh, and I'm grateful to my honourable friend for Fylde for his uh, intervention. Uh, as we have heard, antisocial behaviour can have a significant impact on both individuals and communities. It can affect people in their own homes uh, and in our public spaces, which everyone should be free to enjoy safely. Left unchecked, persistent antisocial behaviour, uh, whether it involves littering, vandalism, public drunkenness, aggressive dogs, noise, threats or abuse, can have a debilitating impact on uh, people's qualities of life. And, and as I say, honourable members have uh, taken care to describe uh, various examples. I'm, I'm sure we were all um, uh, 
perturbed to hear the experience in Hindburn of the noise at, uh, in the middle of the night, and uh, we know that these offences can sadly lead to a journey of even more serious crimes, as outlined by the Honourable Member for Mitcham and Morden. Uh, there are a range of powers and actions available to the police and local authorities. We tend, of course, in this debate to focus on the 2014 Act, but there are, of course, general operational powers that the police and councils have. So, for example, in uh, the Honourable Member for uh, Hull North's constituency, I note that the police have been working alongside Hull City Council, uh, who have installed 17 CCTV cameras uh, on the Orchard Park estate to drive down the number of crimes. And I understand that the police locally have been working uh, with communities in the area to make sure they feel safe, including visiting schools to speak to pupils about the impact of behaving antisocially. Uh, that's not part of the 2014 Act, but it's part of their general powers and uh, actions. Uh, and uh, she also mentioned uh, the use of drones by Lincolnshire Police. These are proving to be useful in a great many uh, uh, ways. Uh, obviously, Lincolnshire is an incredibly uh, rural, vast area, and I know that uh, my uh, Police and Crime Commissioner, Mark Jones, uh, is pleased with the uh, use of drones in tackling hair coursing, which is not a form of antisocial behaviour that's been mentioned today, but believe you me, the impact on local communities is uh, frightening and intimidating and, and uh, uh, maybe one of those uh, examples of the more serious types of antisocial behaviour. Uh, I'm uh, pleased to say that we have reformed the tools and powers available to local areas through the Antisocial Behaviour, Crime and Policing Act 2014. Um, mention was made of ASBOs. Uh, uh, they were, I think it's fair to say, they initially were of use, but we know that they became a badge of honour among some protagonists, which is why we reviewed the coalition government reviewed the law regarding uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the action to tackle uh, antisocial behaviour and brought about the 2014 Act. I'll give way. It strikes me the point she just made is a very middle class view. What, what do working class communities think about uh, ASBOs? Were they ever asked that, whether they were beneficial before they were taken away? The children who were subject to them, they were becoming a badge of honour. That's precisely why we have uh, increased the range of powers uh, in, under the 2014 Act to target not just people, individuals who are be behaving antisocially, but also to give much wider powers when it comes to protecting whole communities, whole public spaces, which I'll come on to in a moment. I note um, uh, earlier, I, uh, before I move on from this, and um, before I give way, uh, of course we've had a debate just this week, a UQ, on knife crime prevention orders, which are a very targeted form of preventative order, um, which we're introducing through the Offensive Weapons Bill to uh, help catch the small cohort of children um, who may be susceptible to knife crime before they start accumulating criminal convictions or uh, causing even more harm in the community. And I very much hope those will meet the support of the House when the Bill returns. I give way. I'm grateful to the Minister for giving way. It's that very point about the uh, introduction of those preventative uh, orders which the uh, Minister spoke at the dispatch box, box about earlier this week that I wanted to highlight that ASBOs were about, you didn't have to have a conviction for an, for an ASBO order to be given. And it seems to me now that you have to have the conviction to get the criminal behaviour order. As I explained, there's real problems with enforcement of that. And isn't it time to have a look again whether this is really working, the changes introduced in 2014? We, we um, are reviewing the powers. At, at, towards the end of my speech, I'll talk about the powers, that, uh, the um, uh, reviews that are uh, being undertaken. But it was very much from a place of wanting to improve on the work that was done. I fully acknowledge the work that was done in the uh, uh, noughties uh, to tackle uh, antisocial behaviour. Uh, but we thought that by increasing the range of powers available in the 2014 Act, that that would help ad address some of the problems that had arisen as a consequence over the uh, years since the introduction of ASBOs. Uh, and the, the 2014 Act pre uh, 
introduces a, a range of powers that are scaled up or down depending on the nature of the antisocial behaviour. They are flexible, they enable local agencies to tailor their approach to the individual circumstances of antisocial behaviour and they range from tools to intervene early uh, to those that can be used to address the most serious and persistent uh, ASB. Wherever possible, it's important to stop this behaviour before it escalates, uh, which is why we introduced the civil injunction, which may impose prohibitions or positive requirements on people, for example, requiring the perpetrator to fix damage to someone else's property. Where behaviour becomes more serious and involves or occurs alongside criminal activity, a criminal behaviour order, as uh, the Honourable Members just mentioned, may be made. Uh, these uh, uh, can impose prohibitions and requirements to stop the antisocial behaviour, for example, by prohibiting the offender from entering a particular area. Unfortunately, some areas can become hotspots for antisocial behaviour, as was described vividly by my honourable friend for Bolton West, who described the antisocial behaviour in, I think, Horwich? Um, and he focused on the point, as did other uh, colleagues, uh, of the role of alcohol uh, that can, uh, the, the role that alcohol can play in some forms of antisocial behaviour. Uh, one of the points I'd like to draw out uh, in terms of our uh, actions to tackle uh, antisocial alcohol consumption is the growth of local alcohol action areas. Uh, which are um, multi-agency work uh, that that are conducted in 32 areas in England and Wales. Uh, For example, Wrexham is taking part in a Drink Less, Enjoy More initiative to reduce alcohol sales in pubs, bars and clubs to intoxicated individuals. And we've given new powers to relevant authorities to tackle alcohol-related crime and harms. Uh, For example, placing cumulative impact policies on a statutory footing, making changes to the late-night levy, which will make it more flexible and fairer to businesses, and giving new powers to immigration officers to tackle illegal working in licensed premises. Uh, um, We've also uh, introduced a range of powers uh, to uh, look at the uh, local area uh, that may be suffering from antisocial behaviour. And so, uh, for example, the dispersal power can be issued by the police requiring an individual committing antisocial behaviour, crime or disorder, to leave an area for up to 48 hours. Uh, The community protection notice uh, can be used by the police and local councils to address unreasonable behaviour affecting a community's quality of life, such as graffiti, rubbish and noise, and the public spaces protection order, which a council can use to put restrictions on an area where behaviour has or is likely to have a detrimental effect on the local community. And I know several councils have looked at using PSPOs to uh, uh, try and uh, control alcohol consumption in public places. Uh, But as we've heard, um, local communities are the ones who suffer from antisocial behaviour and we wanted to enable local communities to uh, speak up and to uh, call out, if you like, um, the authorities when they don't believe that they are being listened to. And so the community trigger gives victims of persistent antisocial behaviour the ability to demand a formal case review where a locally defined threshold is met, and the community remedy gives victims a say in the out-of-court punishment of antisocial behaviour perpetrators. Um, Now, the Honourable Member for Kingston-upon-Hull North asked about guidance, and uh, we want to help local agencies understand both the powers and the informal measures they can use to tackle antisocial behaviour, which is why we have published statutory guidance for frontline professionals. We updated that guidance in December 2017 to reflect feedback from uh, those who are working with these powers and to remind them of the importance of proportionality and transparency in the use of the powers. I would like to reassure members that the Home Office keeps these powers and the Government's overall approach to tackling antisocial behaviour under review through a national strategic board. This brings together representatives from key agencies and across government to consider our approach and identify any emerging issues. This debate is timely, as the board will meet again next week and will no doubt consider the points raised in today's debate. 
state. I am also very grateful to uh, agencies and, and organisations such as the Local Government Association, who very kindly invited me to an event last year to uh, discuss antisocial behaviour and the use of public space protection orders. Uh, it is very, very much through a multi-agency um, uh, work uh, programme that we will help to uh, really bear down on antisocial behaviour in local communities. Now, the members opposite um, were very keen to address the issue of police funding. And I, I always say when I'm, I have to uh, tackle police funding um, uh, that I, I regret having to give people a, a mini history lesson, but we, it is important just to put uh, the decisions that have been made over the last few years into context. We inherited a very, very difficult economic um, p picture in 2010. We had to make very, very tough decisions to uh, address the mess we were in economically because of the way in which things had been run in years gone by in the tw uh, under the Labour government. Uh, that is why we made tough decisions, and I hear members opposite saying, well, you've had long enough, uh, and that is precisely why the Home Secretary, the then Home Secretary in 2015, was able to say to the Chancellor, we must please protect police funding uh, because we had managed the economy in such a way that we could begin to uh, you know, make those changes in um, police funding and in our other, other areas, but particularly in police funding. It's been protected since 2015. Last year, uh, this House, well, Conservative uh, members of Parliament, voted for a funding settlement that increased police funding by uh, up to £470 million. And this week, Conservative members, the Government, have voted to inject a further £970 million into policing with the help of police and crime commissioners, um, which sadly members opposite did not feel able to support. So if I may just uh, uh, outline what that means from um, uh, the... Uh, uh, from the um, uh, funding settlement, I'm so sorry. Uh, Humberside will have uh, £11.5 million more than last year because of Tuesday's settlement. Uh, they have a reserves of £28.9 million in reserves, higher than the national average. Uh, uh, Greater Manchester has 30, will receive £34.7 million more than last year because of Tuesday's vote. Uh, and uh, they have up to they have £75.6 million in reserves, an increase of 20 £25 million pounds since 2011. The reason I keep talking about reserves is because I want to equip all members in this House, across the House and on our benches, to hold their PCCs to account to ask them how they're spending reserves. I'm about to come on to Lancashire. Uh, I will give way very quickly if I'm... I'll, I'll give way... I'll give way... Oh. I'm so sorry, I'm getting conflicting um, requests I'm, and I'm being asked to speed up. I must mention Lancashire, though, because I was delighted to visit Lancashire uh, last week, met the Chief Constable uh, in Hutton with my honourable friend, the member for South Ribble, uh, met uh, community leaders uh, with my honourable friend, the member for Blackpool North, and uh, uh, met uh, people in Morecambe with my honourable friend, the member for Morecambe and Loonsdale, to discuss cr uh, crime and policing issues in the local area. Uh, they do have uh, a 75 point uh, sorry, they do have £37.9 million in reserves. That's increased by £17.8 million since 2011, which is higher than the national average. I'm not sure the Honourable Gentleman had that information to hand. Happily, happily. I've just, I, the, the Police and Crime Commissioner for Lancashire is actually watching this debate and he's just sent me a very informative message to say that he's published his reserves and they are actually £25 million. I would ask the Minister just to correct that at the dispatch box. I, I, I was going to say that the reserves are £37.9 million as of March last year, last, year, last year. If the PCC has decided to spend some of his savings account, then we as a government welcome it because that's why we give the money to PCCs to spend on policing in the local area not to sit in savings accounts. But I, will, um, I won't uh, trouble the House with Bedfordshire, Met and South Wales, because uh, I know that the House is eager to uh, move on to the adjournment debate. Uh, but I will just deal with the issue of education. Um, we're very, very uh, conscious of the role of uh, alternative provision when it comes to particularly county lines. Uh, the uh, Honourable Members, I hope, will know that we are expecting a, result, uh, a report from uh, Edward Timpson looking at the provision of alternative provision, because we're very conscious of the impact it can have on um, serious violence. I'm, I must say I'm pleased that we 
we have raised the age at which children can leave education from 16 to 18, but I am conscious that, of course, there is still some children who uh, uh, fall through uh, the net with that, and that is why Edward Timpson's report will be so informative and important. I'm extremely grateful to all members across the House for their contributions in this debate. Antisocial behaviour is uh, still affecting communities. I'm being, I'm being indicated uh, that I mustn't take the intervention. I hope the honourable gentleman will understand. And may I thank everyone for their robust debate today. Diana Johnson to one. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And could I just start by thanking the Minister for those kind words about the ongoing Libby Squire investigation. I'm very pleased that we've had the opportunity to have this debate this afternoon, and I'd like to thank all uh, honourable members who took part. Um, particularly, it, it was uh, interesting what my honourable friend, the member for Mitchman Morden, said about parts of the debate being almost déjà vu, and we were talking about reinventing the wheel at times. It's very clear that mistakes have been made, particularly around police cuts since 2010, and I think the thin blue line now really is too thin. And no one can seriously say the fact that Labour increased police numbers when it was in government to mean that we had neighbourhood policing and more police officers on the beat and PCSOs. That was the reason that we had a banking crisis and the subprime mortgage crisis in the USA. And so to try and argue that that had to then be dealt with by an incoming coalition government is frankly trite. And, the, and Her Majesty's Inspector of Constra Constabulary in 2010, I remember this, said that there could be cuts of up to 12% in police budgets without affecting the front line. But we've got to over 30% of cuts to police budgets. And choices have been made by, by co the coalition government and then successive conservative governments to give tax cuts to the rich, for instance, and not to protect uh, policing. And combined with those cuts to local authorities, it's no, no one should think it's any surprise that we're ending up with the levels of antisocial behaviour that we're seeing today. And I just want to say again to the Minister, I really would ask the Minister to look again at that legislative change that came in after 2010, which took the, having the victim of antisocial behaviour away from the centre and put them on one side and seem to put the rights of um, young people or youths who were not behaving well and engaging in criminal activity, it seemed, seemed to give them more rights. And I think we need to review that. We need to have the victim at the heart of whatever we do in terms of antisocial behaviour, legislation and protection. Here, here. The question is, as on the order paper, as many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. aye, the contrary no, I think the ayes have it. The eyes have it.